live from the mist and shrouded mountaintop fortress that is X and Y Communications Headquarters. You're listening to the world famous Mountaintop Podcast. And now, here's your host, Scott McKay. Oh, how's it going, gentlemen? Welcome to yet another episode of the world famous Mountaintop Podcast. I am Scott McKay at Scott McKay on just about every social media platform. If you haven't checked out, at Scott McKay on YouTube. I'm doing new videos every Tuesday, gentlemen. Two minutes and under is all it takes for me to expose one of the biggest myths in dating and relationship advice and set it right with actionable advice that's actually going to work for you instead of all the old wise tales. I don't know how you get old wise tales in men's dating advice. That sounds especially heinous, but hey, that just makes this YouTube channel all the more important, right? As always, the website is mountaintoppodcast.com and the Facebook group also, as always, nothing's changed there either, is Mountaintop Summit. With me today is a new friend of mine. We talked quite a bit before I started a roll-in on this podcast episode. His name is Richard Struther. He is the widower's wingman. Now, before you guys say, oh, this isn't for me and click stop on this podcast episode and move on. We're not actually going to talk about widowhood all that much in this episode. Instead, we're going to extend the topic to something that is relatable to just about everybody at some point in their life, which is getting back out there, meeting some women again after a relationship for whatever reason isn't there for you anymore. Getting back out there, dating, relating to women, and all the issues surrounding that. So without anything further, Richard Struther, welcome to the show, man. Thank you for having me on, Scott. Yeah, man, it's a pleasure to have you here. Now, I want you to give us a little bit of backstory about how you came up with the vision and the passion for being the widower's wingman in particular. Well, I've been a coach for many, many years. I have been, I was a trainer for Apple for eight years, and I did a lot of technology coaching. So beyond just, you know, not IT department stuff. And then a while back, I had a conversation with a good friend, and I was like, you know, I feel I could be having more impact. I feel like I could be doing something more, you know, better for the world. And it, it kind of, you know, where your life experiences and all of that. And I lost my wife, Samantha, in 2018, in October of 2018. And I, I looked around and there was a remarkable, a remarkably small amount of resources for widowed men. And I was like, this is ridiculous. And even the resources that were out there, the dating resources were, you know, they just kind of glossed over it. You know, it's like, yeah, yeah, just get out there. It's like, no, there's more to it than that. So that became the widower's wingman, and I'm really about having your back through the whole process. So, Now, something, Richard, you just said that I fully agree with is that there's this kind of glib dating advice of, hey, just get back out there. Just be yourself. You know, fake it till you make it. All of this kind of pat on the back dating advice, which just makes everybody roll their eyes because it's just too, Isn't it terrible? It's just too universal. What happens when a guy is widowed? What's really going on? I'm sure different guys have different experiences on a case by case basis, but just give us a little bit of an idea of why you simply can't just get back out there. I love that question. And the reason it's so important is because when you, when you lose somebody, when you lose a partner that you've had for a long, long time, it's not just your partner that you lose. I mean, you're so tied up in your relationship, your roles, your identity, you lose a huge part of yourself, your identity. So you kind of have to, you have to reimagine, not only do you lose the person, you also lose the expectations of the life you wanted to live with that person. So you don't have, you don't just grieve the person or the memories or what have you. You have to grieve for that future that can't, that can no longer happen. And you have to kind of stop and go, okay, who am I? Are we good? And reimagine, reimagine what the future could be. And that's that's uncomfortable for a lot of people. Yeah, it is. You know, I think you really put some dimension into that topic as you answered the question. And I was hoping you would, you know, when I asked that question in the corner of my mind, I said, you know, here comes an obvious answer. Well, you grieve, dummy. (laughs) You know, you have to spend some time grieving this loss before you get back out there. But in my heart of hearts, I felt comfortable asking you that question, Richard, because I knew you'd put some dimension to it. And you most certainly did. Yeah, it's not just the loss of a significant other. It's a loss of a significant lifestyle, right? Right. A significant mindset. It's a reinvention that you didn't decide you wanted. Exactly that. 
and a tendency of people to want to, you know, damn the torpedoes and go full bore into trying to fix or, you know, get back to normal. Well, normal is not an option, not as you knew it. And now it's a matter of, are you seeking a relationship? And I talk about this a lot, you know, in other places, but are you seeking a relationship to fill a void or to share a life? And that's the key. Yeah, you know, you bring up an excellent point there. A lot of times when we date someone who is a widow, we have a lot of assumptions there, especially if we haven't gone through anything similar ourselves. Those those assumptions would lead us to believe, okay, well, first of all, these two were most definitely madly in love at the time of the partner's demise. And she's probably got a shrine in the back corner of her bedroom where she worships her ex every night. And I'm not going to be able to get in edgewise (laughs) between her and her grieving process. I'm never going to replace that guy. I can't be that guy. So why bother? It's very intimidating. And it's very frustrating for widowed people to have to face that mindset on the part of people they might be going out on dates with, perhaps very casually, who make that assumption. Did you find that frustration ever? Oh, absolutely. Look, um, the, some, of the, some of the people I went out with uh, were worried about being compared. Yeah. And I, I don't I, – I would never uh, because I, I, live in, I live with intention. I, I live you – know, I, I believe in radical honesty and whatnot, and I, I would never compare because there's, they are not you – know, they are not some man. Then this is something completely new, and I'm 100% good with that. But it, it is difficult some, for some people not to compare and to kind of go you – know, or to, to worry about being that – to be judged. Yeah, on the other side of the coin – let me throw this on the table. You do not have an ex-wife. This no. isn't like a divorce. You didn't ask to not be married anymore. You didn't agree with her for this relationship to end. So it's not like you're not a relationship-minded guy. You may very well be a relationship-minded guy and be very relationship-ready some point within a reasonable time after being widowed. But I guess these their own, and this timeline is exactly what we're talking about today in terms of how to decide when to get back out there. And I guess it would be worth it to discuss that for a while. Well, let me add something on on just on that too, or aside to that. There's also what my current partner calls uh, odors of sainthood, which is when somebody dies. If your relationship, every relationship has its struggles, has its friction, and people tend to go, you know, somebody dies, they go, oh, well, they were one of the good ones. They might have been an asshole, but nobody says it. So when you're, when it's a divorce or when you have an ex, you can, you can be angry. You can misdirect your anger at them all you want. You, there's, there's a chance for resolution there. It's not, it's not off the table. You can still, you know, you can rage and, and, and holler at them all you want. But when somebody dies, all of a sudden it's, you know, this, this idea of we can't speak ill or we can't, you have to kind of come to terms with that part of what wasn't good and instead of idolizing or having the shrine, as you said. So there's that too. You know, I want to add something to what you just said, and I don't <laughs> want to get away from the main no, topic that we're about to discuss, but this absolutely deserves being put on the table here. I actually dated several widowed women, none of whom were still worshiping their deceased husband. None of them. One of them had a very sunny disposition and was very ready to move on. I mean, she didn't want to forget who was the father of her son as well as her husband, but she knew better than to impose that not only on the guys she was dating, but really impose it on herself either because it isn't fair to anybody. It isn't even fair to the deceased spouse. So I had that experience. And the other experience was I found out another woman was widowed who I was about to go on a date with. And I, you know, offered all the social graces that I normally would. And she said, oh, don't bother. He was a jerk. We were (laughs) ready to get divorced anyway. He did us both a favor by kicking the bucket. I mean, I didn't wish the guy to die or anything, but we really got to the point where we couldn't stand each other anymore. And he was cheating on me and I'd had enough and we had already hired lawyers and he had a car accident. And basically that solved the situation. I said, well, Now, that was the theater of the unexpected, but she was very ready to get out there and date again because for her, 
it was kind of like a divorce was finalized ahead of schedule. I mean, she didn't wish death upon the poor bastard, you know. Clearly. But it wasn't anything at all like she had a shrine in her bedroom to this guy. You know what I mean? So clearly not. <laughs> we make all kinds of assumptions about widowed people. And really, we should have a much more open mind and maybe just listen to someone who's widowed. A lot of people are just very intimidated from dating widows at all, especially younger widows when they're younger guys. I mean, if we're all in the old folks' home, you know, dating around in the villages in Florida or something, I guess it's part of the territory. But much less so when you're when you're younger. Another woman I met was widowed because her husband was killed in action in the Middle East military. Oh, right. So, I mean, since that was like an international incident, there was a lot of attention given to it by the media and by certain organizations who take care of Gold Star families. And it was almost like she had to sidestep the trappings of what the circumstances were sometimes just to live a normal life and to go date again. Exactly. Yeah, that's another nuance, you know? Well, and the expectations, the judgments that come, it, they may be well-meaning, of course, but everybody's saying, you know, or you know, when you hear it from friends, family, colleagues, whatever, it's like, really so soon or you know to, well i just can't see you with somebody else it's like eight that's years later <laughs> eight years later, right yeah. and it's like yeah but thank you but that's not helpful because <laughs> that doesn't help me when i'm alone in bed at night you know or when i when i come home and i want to be you know when i want to share my day or i want to share my life or i want you know that i seek i crave we all crave touch intimacy and i'm not just talking sex I, you know we all crave that that intimacy that person that we can have as our confidant, our companion, our, you know, somebody who is there for us. You know, what's interesting, Richard, as you're talking, I'm considering how couples routinely put together a will or a trust, but they rarely talk about what do you do if I pass or you pass? I have given my wife, Emily, encouragement to go find another guy if I leave this world. And it almost seems like more people should talk about this, even though it's unpleasant. It's kind of like buying your burial plot before you die, you know, but probably you should do it. Why don't people even want to talk about this? Again, this is another question that there could easily be a rote prepackaged answer to, but you know, I know you're a smart guy and think about this a lot. So I can't wait to hear the nuance you put on this, on this particular question as well. Our society, I'm going to give you a package answer to start, but our society has a very unhealthy view around death. And the fact is, is death is part of life. There's no way around that. It, you know, we, we, we even say it all the time, death and taxes. But the fact is, is that we, we really do have some extraordinarily unhealthy views, habits, um, and we, we avoid death. And, and for, for us, it's this thing we don't talk about. We should be talking about it. it we need to talk about it realistically. I, I absolutely agree with you that these are conversations that need to be had. And I'm a huge, I'm a huge fan of Esther Perel. And I believe in having those difficult conversations. And um, as somebody who practices radical honesty um, for well over 20 years, having those hard conversations is just part of life. And it can actually, and I know this is going to sound strange, it can actually be a really fulfilling and rewarding part of life. Man, if I practice radical honesty, I have this deep-seated concern that I would end up like Don Rickles, only not funny. You know, and I don't <laughs> want that for myself. You know, I got to have a little bit of... I've got to extend a little bit of, well, once again, social grace towards people sometimes, or I'd be a handful. You know, I, I got dirty little naughty fantasies in my brain about people often, and they're not always sexual. So let's talk about, well, let, let me at least define radical honesty as honesty to be as honest as one can possibly be without being tactless. Oh, I know. We're, ta we're not talking about a Jim Carrey movie here or anything. As ironically funny as that movie is, I, I get you. I understand. But I I've agree had with better. you. <laughs> <laughs> that line. But I understand where you're coming from. Yeah, there are things we just don't want to talk about, especially in Western first world culture, if you want to call it that, because everything is sugar coated. It's I'm fine. How are you? And anything that is unpleasant or dark, we don't want to talk about. And I've spoken before, Richard, about how that's really all part of Mr. Nice Guy syndrome, right? Yes. And oh, we don't want to make anybody uncomfortable or we don't want to admit that there's anything wrong with us or untoward about ourselves or that needs to be changed because then we might scare somebody off or they may not like us anymore. We may not get that approval we're seeking. And, you know, in developing countries, they just don't have that luxury. That's they have true. to be more real with each other. But we have this convenient way of covering it up either by not 
practicing radical honesty when something needs to be talked about or just faking our way through life, trying to pretend with a smile on our face. And that keeps us from talking about things that really need to be talked about. You know, I've mentioned to guys how they should let their dark side breathe a little bit. And I don't think dark is evil. I think dark is unpleasant. And a lot of guys just won't do the hard things that involve being unpleasant. Like, I've got to do this. I've got to do that. But I'm going to put my head in the sand and act like an ostrich instead because I just don't want to face it. All that is weakness, not strength. So I, I would even I would even argue that it's not even unpleasant. It's just uncomfortable. But oh, I mean, at I find discomfort unpleasant. So we're on the same page for sure. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of times when widowed, I'm sure there's a, a tendency to smooth things over because they don't know how to talk about it with you. Uh, a lot of people, when someone else is going through something unpleasant, tragically in our culture, they'll avoid them. Like yes. When we hear someone's dying of cancer or we hear that someone's lost someone very close to them, we don't want to get in on that unpleasant situation. So we we distance ourselves from it. And I think that's just an awful feature of Western culture. But we do that. I, I would say there's a second part to that. Yeah. Where you have people who, um, hey, don't be down. Let me jolly you out of this. And it's this is not a short term thing. This is not something you jolly somebody out of um, just to be able to sit there with somebody in. And yes, it's uncomfortable to be able to be to be able to sit with somebody in that uncomfortable situation or, you know, with their discomfort or with their grief or whatever they have, just to know that somebody's got their back. That is often a lot more helpful then people seem to, you know, then the, the majority of people realize. Certain cultures are better at this than others. I think of Jewish folks who sit Shiva together yes. for seven days a morning. And it's not about patting each other on the back and talking. A lot of it is built around the silence of just being together and indicating we support each other. Exactly. That's my understanding of the Jewish tradition of sitting Shiva after someone's passed. And... Other people just make potato salad, hold a picnic, and move on. And like you said, there's sort of like a pendulum effect. Either I'm going to distance myself from this unpleasant situation and let this person grieve alone, or I'm going to try to butter them up and perk them up and say, oh, get over it. But it seems like there's no reality either way that pendulum swings. You know what I mean? Well, there's also a third part of that too, which is when when people are kind of, you know, trying to jolly you out of it or whatever, if if people are going and talking about, yes, you want to share your memories and all the good parts, but in, in some cases, people can almost interrupt your ability to grieve. And, and you know, you wind up taking care of them because right. we're men. That's what we do. So we're taking care of them and we don't, it delays our chance to do what we need to do to grieve for ourselves. And then, of course, if there's kids or if there's, you know, and then it's, you've got to go back to work because nobody gives long bereavements. And, and now it's, now it's a matter of, okay, and I have to, I have to handle everybody else. And now I'm back to life. Everybody's gone on their merry way. And now I have to deal with it. Yeah, that's really twisted, isn't it? But we as men are exactly like that. We feel like we oh, have yeah. to carry the people who are there to help us mourn. Right. And that becomes burdensome. Yeah. I think that's yep. I think that's an excellent observation and very true. So let's talk about the core topic here of today's show. Obviously there are other ways people can find that a relationship ends other than widowhood. There are breakups, there are divorces. Uh, of course. I've known people, their spouse, significant other, boyfriend, girlfriend, whoever, just disappeared. You yeah. know, they're on the lamb or they just they left. They they hid or there was no closure. And I think it's worth mentioning that when there is no closure, that can be really tough psychologically and hard to figure out when to move on. I mean, I went out on a date with a woman who had to wait two years to date again because the court had to decide that he wasn't coming back after two years. Because he did exactly what I just referred to. He just disappeared. He just vaporized. He left one day and never came back. Was never oh, heard wow. from him again. And imagine, that's like that lack of closure, that leaving that Zagarnik loop open is just like, oh, it terrorizes terrible. your brain. Absolutely. You know? I mean, there's even been shows, you know, movies built on this premise, like the the ex or the lost spouse or boyfriend appears out of nowhere after years and creates havoc because this person's remarried or whatever, you know, and 
That's brutal. But I think that's a relatively small percentage of the population. Most of these guys thankfully. listening. Yeah, thankfully. My goodness. And God bless those people for whom it's the case, especially the people who vaporize probably. <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> as far as us as men listening to this show, most of us have probably gone through a breakup or a divorce and we're given all sorts of shade tree advice on when to get out there again. Uh, someone's going to say, oh, no, you need to get out there immediately. One of my quasi mentors, uh, Homer McDonald, was famous in his career for saying, hey, if she says she wants to leave, help her pack her bags and get a new girlfriend the next day. Oh, oh wow. sure. Right. Other right. people, probably more mainstream people are like, oh, wait, at least a year before you go out and date again. I'm like. To do what? Feel sorry for yourself and be lonely and drown in internet porn for 365 days? I mean, you got to get out there and be social again. But I think the fear, and you can either back me up on this or set me straight, is, I mean, you shouldn't just cease being social. I mean, there's a big difference between going cold turkey without ever interacting with another female human being for at least a year or whatever timelines artificially imposed and going out there and rebounding into another long-term relationship. There's a little gray area there, don't you think? Oh, there's a huge gray area. <laughs> I, I am in support of the one year. And the only reason I, especially with widowed, um, divorce may be a little bit different, again, because there are different options for closure or whatnot. But when there is no closure or when it's something where you have to grieve, even if it's a divorce, if you are the one being divorced and you have to, you know, kind of mourn the loss or, again, mourn that life that you had planned for or that you expected and now it now it isn't, the one year, especially when somebody dies, is you really do need time to stop and go, okay, what is valuable in my life? What am I willing to change? What is healthy to change? Because there are a lot of people, um, whether it's a divorce, whether it's a, whether it's a loss of a partner, um, whether it's somebody who disappeared, they, they will go, oh my God, I've got to change everything. And then all of a sudden they're in an apartment they can't afford or a place they can't afford. They find themselves alone, isolated, they've made bad decisions or bad financial decisions, or they jumped into a long-term relationship with somebody who is not necessarily the person for them, whether that's narcissistic or whether it's, you know, there's so many options here. So I can, I'll just sum it up like that. So for that, I do believe in the one year, but um, as for when somebody is ready, I think it's important to get into the, um, why are you looking for a relationship? And I think that's the biggest key. It's not about time, but, where you are in your journey to to go to go okay i'm i'm me i'm okay and i want to share a life rather than oh my god i got to fill this hole all right richard what i hear you saying is people have some housekeeping to do oh yeah after a traumatic relationship event before they even think about another relationship i suppose i'm thinking less on such a grand scale i'm with you 100% that you should bide your time Yes. And take your time between long-term committed relationships. But on the other hand, I think a lot of people say, don't even go out for coffee with someone because I don't trust you. Oh, you're no, vulnerable no, no. right now, and you're going to get into this long-term relationship, and you're going to get on the rebound. Next thing you know, you've done it too soon, and I don't want that for you. I guess I trust people more, and I'm thinking you're probably going to agree with me on this piece, to at least go out and socialize. I mean, go to a meetup group and talk to female human beings. Uh, get out there and realize you're still attractive. Let someone flirt with you at the grocery store. Don't completely divorce yourself from being social simply because you just got divorced from a woman. That's sort of 100%. Thing. Yeah. 100% social. And especially when you lose somebody, staying social is probably the biggest key is probably one of the more important things. And if you know somebody who's lost, whether it's a divorce, whether it's uh, an actual, you know, a death or what have you, please do your part, get them out. Yeah, without an agenda. Right. It's like, hey, I just want to get you out of the house. Uh, one of the things that we talked about on a recent show, and I thought it was really profound, was men don't check up on each other. Talk about the I'm fine, how are you culture. Guys are just like, yeah, yeah, I'm doing well. And we don't ever drill down and say, hey, you know what? I I sense you might be hurting. Let's talk about this. Let me buy you a beer. And when a guy's been broken up with or a guy's just gone through a divorce or God forbid widowed, uh, you know, even full grown men who call themselves masculine and call themselves leaders and call themselves virtuous men. Sometimes those guys will just 
abandon their buddies out of awkwardness. That's the time we need to check in on our friends, even our acquaintances, and make friends out of them at that time and say, hey, you know what? I just want to get you out of the house. Let's go play golf. Let's go have a beer. Let's go do something social because I sense you might need it. And let the guy tell you no. But yeah. most of the time, he's going to say, well, yeah, man, that'd be pretty cool. Let's do that. And it's like, all right, let's do that. That's how men should be in community with each other at times like this. I and, agree. you know, if you go out and you meet women, enjoy it. There's no pressure. There's no rush. You don't even have to go out on a date with a woman you just met and flirted with. If you don't feel like for whatever reason it's time to ask women out and actually go on real dates, well, then don't pressure yourself. I mean, frankly, Richard – Guys who are single and haven't been in a relationship for quite some time and aren't in any grieving process in particular still talk themselves out of that for whatever That's, reason. You know, too you're much pressure. So right. Yeah. You're so right there. Riff on all that, man. Have at it. <laughs> um, social is hugely important. Yes. Um, I agree. We need to have a much better culture for men. Um, and the, the other thing is, uh, I think that men would be better if we kind of went with a little more radical candor or a little more radical honesty in that, you know, how you doing? Not so good. What's going on? And say it like it is. There's no shame in that. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, it's okay to not be okay. And, and we're kind of trained out of that from when we're young. So yeah. And I really love the idea of, yes, be there for, be there for your friends, be there for your colleagues, be there for, you know, I, I'm fully supportive of that. And it, yes, if you want to go out with the cashier who you flirted with or the, you know, somebody, it's okay to be friends. And especially as we are more mature, we're not looking for the puppy dog love fling. Don't get me wrong. It's nice. But we're looking for a more substantial long-term relationship. And that starts usually with a good friendship where there's trust built. You know, you mentioned the puppy dog fling. Ah, uh, yes. Let's turn the tables on this. Okay. I think another aspect of this conversation that deserves some discussion is what if we fall into depression after the loss of a relationship, even the loss of life of a significant other, and just go on a downward spiral of self-destruction? I mean, that's been known to happen. Drink too much. I'm not married anymore. I'm free. So you know what? I'm just going to go out and be a man whore and screw everything that has a skirt on. And all of those potentially unhealthy actions can really prohibit a guy from growing and moving on. And I mean, it's not gender specific, of course, but of course this not. audience is all men. How do we know when we're being self-destructive as opposed to getting out there and breathing a little? What's the boundary? For me, it's a big thing has to do with purpose and identity, right? And that's the, um, if you're being self-destructive, it's, most of us know when we're being self-destructive. We have that inkling and sometimes it feels good. It feels good to do something stupid every once in a while. Let's be fair. But when you look at this and go, is this who I, is this really who I am or who I want to be? Cause that's a big part of it. Um, you're right. A lot, there's a lot of men who get into depression because They've been caring for their partner for a long time, or their relationship was really kind of the anchor of their life. That was the, the pillar on which they leaned, and now it's gone. Mm. So where's your identity? Who are you? And I find that most people who fall into depression or don't take care of themselves, I mean, that ultimately comes down to, am I respecting myself and my identity? And not necessarily, you may not know who you are yet. Or you may have lost who you are in a long-term relationship or part of it anyway. We did mention that earlier. But that, that is really a big part of it is, are you being true to who you are and or who you want to be? And is this, is this going to benefit you kind of getting to where you want to be? But you have to know. You have to know your purpose. You have to know or at least have an inkling as to where you want to go to. Um, Mahatma Gandhi, speed doesn't matter if you're going in the wrong direction. <laughs> I say that one a lot. That's very true. Yes. Yeah. You know, uh, you bring up a great point in that we as guys love our setup, don't we? We get oh, everything yeah. exactly the way we want it. And we feel like we've gained mastery over our lives because everything's in position and we tend to let it stay that way. Sometimes at the expense of becoming stagnant rather than growing. And I exactly. can only imagine there's a very real danger after the disruption associated with widowhood where you're saying to yourself, but I want to, I want to cling to as much of my setup as I can. I want to live in the same house and drive the same car and do the same job. And 
have the living room arranged the same way and watch the same TV shows, but you just can't. It's too profound of a disruption. And maybe the first step for a lot of us as guys is to embrace the disruption and do what I call being unsettled. I mean, again, yes. you didn't ask for being widowed, but something indeed had to give. Something had to change. And I, I love the way you talk about it because it leaves a lot of middle ground instead of gravitating towards extremes. And I think that's just fantastic. Good stuff. Thank you. You're quite welcome. Neurologically, there's also a reason for this, by the way. And I'm a neuroscience nerd, so if, if I can oh, take up for just a second. Um, our executive function, the, where we make decisions about our future and what's good for us and, you know, these, these kind of more uh, elaborate decisions we have to make are in the prefrontal cortex. And that actually requires calories. It, it's tiring. If you sit at a screen and do the same job over and over, you can go for hours and hours and it doesn't tire you up. The screen might a little bit tire you, make your eyes get tired. But when you're making decisions, when you're living with intention, when you're, you have to build that stamina up. Because it does take energy. It tires us out to do it. So we, we live by these patterns. We live by these heuristics, these things that we do because, you know, well, we, I do this because it works. We tire a shoe the same way because, well, why would you learn another way until you have to learn another way? Well, when we, we hold on to what we know because it's easy and it, it allows us to take that kind of – to coast a little bit and give our brain a little, a little bit of rest. So you're right. We can fall into that rut and we don't want to be cruising in that rut because we don't want to dig it any deeper. So we do have to get out. We do have to socialize. We do have to expand our neuroplasticity, fancy terms, for we've got to try new stuff. We've got to expand our horizons. We've got to get out there and do. And your identity doesn't appear to you in a dream. This is not a prophecy. You find your identity by, by finding what gives you not happiness but fulfillment. Mm, fantastic. His name is Richard Struther. He is the widower's wingman. And when you go to mountaintoppodcast.com front slash Struther, S-T-R-O-T-H-E-R, like other with a stra in front of it, uh, you'll find his website, the widower's wingman, where he's got lots of resources for you. And if you want to sign up to talk to Richard, he's there for you too. Richard Struther, thank you so much for a very necessary and interesting conversation on a topic that a lot of us don't even like dealing with, let alone talking about. So thank you for the work you do. Thank you for your courage. And man, I can only wish you the best. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Yeah. And gentlemen, if you haven't visited mountaintoppodcast.com lately, get in on the master classes, get in on the free newsletter that you can sign up for there by entering your email address, download your free copy of sticking point solved. I don't talk about it enough. It's a free book that covers just about every sticking point a man could possibly face when dating and relating to women. That's there for you free of charge. When you go to mountaintoppodcast.com also visit our sponsors, which include Jocko Willink's company origin in Maine Hero Soap Company, and also the keyport.com. When you partake of any of the goodies from any of our main sponsors, please use the coupon code MOUNTAIN10 to get an additional 10% off. And as always, guys, I'm here for you. I'm exactly who you think I'm going to be. And when you sign up to talk to me for 25 minutes, we can talk about what's on your mind and perhaps even put together a plan of action where you have the right women in your life once and for all. It's all there for you and more at mountaintoppodcast.com. And until I talk to you again real soon, this is Scott McKay from X and Y Communications in San Antonio, Texas. Be good out there. <laughs> The Mountaintop Podcast is produced by X and Y Communications. All rights reserved worldwide. Be sure to visit www.mountaintoppodcast.com for show notes. And while you're there, sign up for the free X and Y Communications newsletter for men. This is Ed Roy Odom speaking for The Mountaintop Podcast.